find out up to uh, half of the sedimentary rocks in many of the sedimentary basins now have been reinterpreted as turbidites and more rocks are being more rock units are being reinterpreted as turbidites um, every day the world is full of these turbidite deposits now the, the existence of a turbidite deposit does not prove Noah's flood you with me it doesn't prove Noah's flood because obviously they happen even in the modern world but the fact is the world is full of these if the biblical model is correct the world ought to be full of them <laughs> and it is this is what we've been saying. Our prediction is borne out. Another example that has helped geology move into a more catastrophic stance is the example from Mount St. Helens. In one eruption sequence on the slopes of Mount St. Helens, in places up to 600 feet were laid, 600 feet of deposit were laid down by these various events, by not only ash falling out of the sky, but mud flows screaming down the side of that volcano at speeds of up to 100 miles or so an hour are pyroclastic flow deposits. And, and by the time these things were down, by the time their damage had been done, not only were these bedded deposits, but they were finely laminated deposits. The sorts of things that geologists have forever interpreted as slow and gradual deposition, we now know the best interpretation is that they were rapidly deposited. And so geologists are going back into other areas that, that uh, have, have traditionally been interpreted as slow and gradual. And, and come to the conclusion that they really are catastrophic deposits. Here's a deposit in the Grand Canyon, the Tapetes sandstone. The Tapetes sandstone has traditionally been interpreted as a slow and gradual deposit. But in the recent decade or so, many geologists have begun to reinterpret this and to say, well, the evidence never did really fit well with slow and gradual deposition, but we really didn't have a model for rapid deposition, and so now they, they do. And, and they're interpreting the Tapit sandstone, many of them, as a series of catastrophic deposits, of, of mud flows underneath, the, underneath the, uh, the water surface. So they're coming in our direction. Creationists have been talking this way for a long time, and now, now everybody is. Another sort of uh, catastrophic deposit, and I'm just giving you a teaser or two about this. As I say, the world is full of catastrophic deposits. Here's an interesting catastrophic deposit. There's a boulder. See the man here for scale that's a pretty big boulder that's part of a whole county of boulders in East San Diego County in fact there are several layers in, in San Diego that are just full of boulders this is one of the larger boulders but it's a whole it's a whole layer of boulders now what sort of a process would it take to lay down boulders like that without getting in too deeply into this the bottom line is it takes catastrophic processes to lay down a county full of boulders like that in the Grand Canyon, in that Tapete sandstone, which is the lowest level of horizontally bedded sedimentary rock, in the lowest, the, the lowest zone of that Tapete sandstone is a layer of boulders. You can see these basketball size boulders. Elsewhere, that Tapete sandstone is, is full of big boulders. See the person there for scale. This layer of boulders and elsewhere cobbles or maybe a coarse sand, but always the, the, the larger grains are, are preserved in that bottom layer of the Tapit sandstone, which itself is the lowest layer horizontally bedded over the crystalline rocks below. That's called a basal conglomerate in geology. Basal, like basement conglomerate. You know what a conglomerate is. It's, it's a rock unit made up of, of chunks of another sort of a rock from somewhere else. And this basal conglomerate is not only in the Tapit sandstone, which covers an extensive area, it's very typically found in a worldwide sense. Geologists talk about the basal conglomerate as the, the, the bottom layer of what's called the Cambrian system. It's very typically found around the world, not in all locations, but in many. Evidently, as the first tidal wave came screaming through an area, what it was doing was just was scouring off a flat surface, and then whatever it was carrying, the, the large particles began to draw out, to drop out first as, as the intensity of that wave, the energy began to lessen. This is the sort of thing we would insist would be the case if the flood really happened. I've just given you a teaser or two about catastrophic deposition. The, the field of geology is just full of, of speculations and, and new interpretations along catastrophic lines. The point is, 
These are the sorts of things that ought to be true if the Bible's true and the world is made up of rocks catastrophically deposited. Let's move on to, to point number two here. If the flood really happened, then it would have laid down things on a regional scale. If slow and gradual processes were operating on a local scale, we ought to be able to see that the rock units were just of a local nature. But if the flood happened, they might just cover a whole region or maybe even a continent, but certainly a region. Let me show you some evidences, some examples of regional stratigraphy. Here's one of my favorite examples. One coal bed. Coal. Coal is thought to be formed in the bottom of a peat swamp where organic material collects and, and finally that peat is buried and it can turn to coal, so it's thought. But uh, a peat swamp, by definition, is small. You've got to have a mixture of fresh and, and salt water into a brackish uh, area, a swamp. And, well, a, a swamp just can't be very big. But here we find a peat swamp. What sort of a self-respecting peat swamp would be this big? The point I'm trying to make is that something of a different nature was going on in the past, something quite different from, from what we see today was responsible for laying down these rock units in the past, something of a regional nature, something of a global nature, perhaps. Here's another regional bed. This is a sandstone unit. Sandstone, uh, this sandstone is very similar to the sorts of sand uh, deposits you'd find on a beach. This is a, a beach deposit sort of thing. It's a very clean, well-sorted sandstone. And, well, you can see it's extensive. It covers much of the United States and Canada. There, there are parts of this that go all the way over into Europe. This is obviously not a beach sand, although many evolutionists, some have interpreted this, this St. Peter sandstone and its uh, correlating strata as a migrating beachfront. They say oh, one, at one point in time the beach was here and then 10,000 years later it was here and 10,000 years later it was here and 10,000 years later it was here and over millions of years it migrated across the continent. I guess you could interpret it that way, but I've got a better explanation. I've got one that works better. If the flood happened, it would have been laying down regional bedding on a regional scale, not a beachfront but something else, something quite different was going on in the past. The Tapete Sandstone down in Grand Canyon, once again, is a good example of that. The Tapete Sandstone, of course, is found in Arizona, but it's also found up in Chicago and Pennsylvania. And something was going on in the past, quite different from anything even possible today. Our next point on the list of predictions was erosion on a scale far beyond what's even possible today. Let me just point out a couple things here. Uh, underfit rivers is one of the points I mentioned there. It is true that almost all of the river valleys of the world today contain far less water than their present river systems require, than their present valleys indicate. They are underfit. They're just not big enough to have carved out that valley. The Grand Canyon is a good example. In fact, it, um, it used to be thought that the Colorado River migrating back and forth over 70 million years carved out Grand Canyon. By and large, geologists have abandoned that interpretation of Grand Canyon. They've now concluded that the Colorado River, the mechanics are all wrong. It could not have formed Grand Canyon. The Colorado River is much too small to carve out that canyon. Without getting into all the details, I'm convinced that these layers, those horizontally bedded layers were laid down by Noah's flood and then at the later stages when the flood waters were draining off back into the oceans, these waters were carving out huge canyons and, and this is one of them and, well, it was carving out while those rocks were in a soft condition, not in a hard rock condition. Many times as those waters drained off, they drained off in a meandering pattern, like the Mississippi River meanders back and forth. But many times these meandering rivers, such as this one, in, uh, in the San Juan, San Juan River in Colorado, those meander patterns eroded downward. The Mississippi River, as it meanders back and forth, it erodes its banks and it will change its location. That's what meandering rivers do today. What causes a meandering river to erode down? Something very different from anything that's going on anywhere in the world today, except when there's a major flood. There's only one way that, that geologists know that could carve a, a thing like this. And that's with a lot of water traveling through soft, unconsolidated rock. 
this sort of a canyon would never be formed